Welcome back. Well, Mr. Sipo Kadima is still on phone there uh, talking to us on the South African budget that was presented yesterday by the finance minister. Thank you for uh, sticking on, Mr. Kadima. Now, the finance minister said yesterday the fund will be financed through uh, reprioritized spending and increased borrowing, but maintains that the national government is not taking on ESCOM's debt. What's your take on that, and uh, what's the implications of these for South Africans' credit ratings? Well, I think, if anything, the statement by the Minister of Finance yesterday, as read in his budget statement, is more telling. It is more telling that perhaps the government now, more than ever, has given the clearest indication of their intention to privatize ESCOM. you recall that uh, recently in the State of the Nation address, President Cyril Ramaphosa spoke of breaking up of ESCOM into three entities whilst maintaining a holding structure in an entity called ESCOM Holdings. So the finance that will be, uh, or the loan, or the financial support which will be given to ESCOM will be at the holding company, whereas the three divisions that will now come out, or the three subsidiary companies, those are going to be partially privatized or some of them even wholesale privatized through outsourcing. And hence, the amount of support is only 23 billion rent and not the full amount that ESCOM requires. So in terms of borrowings, we are going to see that, in fact, the borrowings will be reduced at the ESCOM holdings level, whereas the underlying entities, which will be generation, transmission, as well as distribution, those will then through partial privatization or wholesale privatization, will then raise uh, capital from that. But that is going to create problems ideologically, as you might be aware that the labor movement or the trade unions in this country are at the forefront of opposing the unbundling as well as the privatization strategy. So the reprioritization of expenditure is very much welcome. The borrowing going forward, we uh, see that quality will be reduced as a direct result of privatization of a key state-owned entity such as ESCOM. Now, let's look at some of the strategies the government is trying to put in place towards the unbundling of the power utility. The finance ma uh, minister said the first step in splitting ESCOM would be to transfer a portion of the utility's assets to a new transmission subsidiary. Strategic equity partners will be invited to provide capital and strengthen oversight. How do you see that? Well, that, as I say, is a clear indication of the intent to privatize ESCOM against all, uh, I mean, all opposition that is to it. But uh, also, we have to uh, bear this in mind that the breaking up of ESCOM is going to complicate the process. In as currently as envisaged, it is unlawful because ESCOM as an enterprise, as an entity, is an organ of statute. It is established in terms of a legislative framework. And there are a number of uh, legislative requirements that will have to be met, uh, some of which include the ESCOM Convention Act of 2001, the Public Finance Management Act, company law in general, as well as the promotion of administrative justice. Those myriad of laws, they are creating a complexity or difficulty for the process to be concluded in the manner that they are envisaging. And even more telling was that the announcement yesterday that there is going to be a new organ or entity called the Chief Restructuring Officer of ESCOM that must be seen in terms of insolvency law of South Africa and specifically under company law, the, uh, what the section referred to as business rescue proceedings. So effectively, we are seeing that ESCOM here is being put in a business rescue whereby the board of ESCOM, the executive management of ESCOM, if anything yesterday from that announcement, have summarily been dismissed, even though they are kept in position, but they no longer have a role. Okay. But importantly is that the role of the chief restructuring officer itself is unlawful, and such a chief restructuring officer would be acting ultra-virus 
as All far right. as the affairs of ESCOM are concerned. All right, Mr. Kadima, thank you very much um, for your time. And on domestic commodities market, latest data from the National Bureau of Statistics shows that the average price paid by consumers for kerosene increased in January 2019. This is despite consumers showing a preference for cooking gas over kerosene. Why is this so? Let's talk to Tumike Olowe, one of the research analysts with Financial Derivatives Company. Hello, Tumike. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Now, tell me, isn't this an irony that consumers are showing a preference for cooking gas over kerosene, yet the average price of kerosene has increased in the last 12 months? What is responsible for this anomaly? Well, we have to look um, at why consumers' preference moved over to cooking gas instead of kerosene. And this is basically due to the fact that using cooking gas is safer, saves time, it's less polluting, and it's convenient. We also need to know that um, we have um, had four users of kerosene, and we have them in the rural areas. In rural area, areas, they use kerosene for lightning and for cooking. While in the urban area, the main users of kerosene are industries, and they use it in the production of their products. For example, um, insecticide or pest, um, pesticides require the use of kerosene. And then in manufacturing aviation fuel, specifically jet A1 fuel, kerosene is a base in its production. So we can see that demand is still relatively high, and this is the reason for the price on the margin. Okay, Nigeria importation of, um, of kerosene, of course, increased to 525.51 million liters. That's in third quarter of 2018. Kerosene is used for both cooking and aviation fuel, and Dangote's refinery is set to commence operations in 2020. Will this reduce the country's import dependence on refined petroleum products and perhaps improve its balance of trade? Currently, we have four refineries in Nigeria, and they are all operating at less than 50% capacity due to poor maintenance and obsolete equipment. If these refineries were operating at full capacity, there would be no reason why we would be importing dual purpose kerosene. And also, we need to consider the fact that we have a growing population. And a growing population means that there's going to be growing demand. And this is what led to the increase of dual purpose kerosene from 224.18 million liters in quarter two to 525.51 million liters in quarter three. Dangote Refinery is going to be the okay. biggest green facility by the time of completion in 2019, and it's going to begin operations next year, 2020. And the estimate is to produce 650,000 barrels per day of refined crude oil. And this isn't only for local consumption, but the aim is to export these goods. Therefore, our import bill is going to reduce, and this is going to create a positive impact on our balance rate and our balance of payments. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Tenuke. We'll have to leave, that, leave it at that. And um, hopefully we'll have time to talk more about this. Thank you for your time. And it's on that note that we draw the curtain on today's edition of the program. Thank you very much for watching. I'm Chimezie Obi Iwabu.